Hello everyone, welcome back to another EU4 video. India has been an area that I haven't done any guides on and there have been a lot of requests for it. So today we will start with the easiest nation to play in India and that's Vijayanagar. So that beginner EU4 players can get their bearings in the region. Vijayanagar is basically the France of India. They are super powerful at the start and with their national ideals they just get better with time. And just like France has Burgundy as their adversary at the start, Vijayanagar has Bahamanis, who are the other big nation in the neighborhood. But they're fairly easy to deal with. And once they are neutralized, there are a ton of smaller Indian nations, sort of like the HRE, except for the aggressive expansion part, which makes playing as Vijayanagar even easier. You can expand really fast and take over basically everyone. The Indian region got a major update when Dharma DLC came out and now we have a lot more provinces and a lot of small nations. So you might think that more provinces might slow down your conquest because of coring costs or that conquering more nations might mean more separatist rebels. But that's not really the case because Vijayanagar also starts as the most powerful Hindu nation and the Hindu religion in the game has some good bonuses. They get plus one tolerance of true faith and plus one tolerance of heathens which does wonders in minimizing unrest. As a Hindu, you also get to choose a deity for every new ruler. There are six different deities you can choose from, which gives two perks each. And which one you choose will depend on your gameplay style. You could choose the Diplo Rep and Improve Relations, or Discipline and Siege Ability, or Missionary Strength, or my favorite one, and clearly the strongest here, minus 10% coring cost and minus 5% aggressive expansion, which are both huge modifiers and work very well when you want to expand fast in India. Hindus also get a unique event chain depending on which deity you choose. These event chains will typically give negative modifiers for a short time and the event chain ends with increasing your ruler's monarch power permanently, which is a good deal. Another perk for playing as a powerful Hindu nation in India is that almost all provinces in the whole Indian region are Hindu, even though they are under non-Hindu nations. Which means when you conquer them as Vijayanagar, there isn't as much unrest and no negative province modifiers for a different religion. Vijayanagar also has a good economy and you need a solid economy to fund your conquest. Indian provinces typically have good development, so the tax income will remain very high all game. You also have a lot of provinces with some of the best trade goods, so the production income will also contribute significantly. As for the trade income, although the trade node of Coromandel isn't an end node, and it has two incoming and three outgoing trade routes, it is a very rich node because it gets a lot of ducats from all of India and the rich trade node of Bengal. So once you get enough trade power in Coromandel node and start conquering the Deccan, Bengal and Gujarat nodes, you will see your trade income rise as well. So as you can imagine, playing as Vijayanagar is fairly easy with basically no downsides. And if you can get an aggressive start and conquer most of India, you can bankroll a huge army to take on literally everyone. With so many nations nearby, the exact strategy of your conquest will depend on the diplomacy around you, although there is a general plan that I follow. I start with taking on Bahamanis before they get a strong ally, then get a good ally yourself, one of Mewar, Malwa or Jaunpur will do, then eat up the minor nations in South India just to clear up the borders, prioritize conquering the coast next, because we need to take over Gujarat and Bengal trade nodes. Take colonization ideas and start colonizing the small islands in the Indian Ocean. This will restrict European expansion into Southeast Asia. Then you can colonize the Cape and the Spice Islands. By this time, you will have a strong economy to field a large army to take over everyone in India and Southeast Asia. And that's a general idea on how to play Vijayanagar. Next, let's look at my playthrough starting as Vijayanagar and forming Bharat. At the start, Vijayanagar has an ally in Andhra and a vassal in Jaffna. We also start with three diplomats and having three diplomats at start is really handy. Early game, I use them to improve relations with the bigger nations in central India so I can get one ally. And after that, I will always use two of my diplomats for creating spy network on the next targets and one diplomat in improving relations with either my ally, my vassals or outraged countries. We also start with a sizable army and a big navy. So we will put the light ships to protect trade in Coromandel node and we'll start marching all armies to the Bahamanese border because we are going to declare on them on December 11th. Typically, Bahamanese won't have a strong ally this early in game. In my game, they were allied to the small nation of Jalawad. They also start with a vassal in telling Ghana. So on December 11th, rival them and declare the war using Reconquest CB. 
This war might drag on for a bit, but you should still come out on top. In my game, the war lasted whole three years and I ended up with zero manpower, but it's very important to cut down Bahamanis at the start before they get any allies. From this war, I like to take all their money and humiliate them for the power projection and the age objective and just take these three provinces we have course on. This will complete a mission and give us more claims on them, which will help in future wars. And just in three years, we are a great power. After this, I decided to conquer all the minor states in the south for the next eight years or so. I had no manpower and I didn't want to fight any major battles, so it seemed like a good idea to just clean up some borders near me. Also, if you leave the small nations for too long, they will ally someone bigger and then it's just a pain to take all that land. So the quicker you do it, the better. I started with full annexing Mysore, then taking over Kandy and Kotev, which I gave to my vassal Jaffna. Then I took over Maldives as well and the rest of minor nations here. Although my manpower was only looking worse now, I was 12k in deficit in manpower, which is pretty bad. But by 1454, we had all of southern India with clean borders, so it was worth it. During this time, the rise of Chellapa Narasimha even fired. This event gives you three options. Either make... I am not going to try to say his name again. Either you make him a general or get autonomy in a lot of provinces with plus 0.25 monthly autonomy change till end of game, which is a terrible modifier. Or you lose stab and get some separatists. I like making him a general because, well, we get a free general. Although later this will lead to some pretender rebels and you will lose stab anyways. The upside is that we have a bad air with 2 to 1 stats and negative improved relations modifier. So it's possible that you might get a good air from these pretender rebels. The stats of the pretender are completely randomized though. In my game, I got a 201 pretender which was worse than my air, so I just killed the rebels and moved on. In your game, you might get a really good pretender and then you can decide if you want to keep your heir or take the pretender as your next ruler. Also be aware of the peasant's war disaster and make sure the stab never goes below zero. By the way, my king was also pretty awesome. He had minus 5% tech discount, plus 1 tolerance and 10% goods produced modifier. All really good things. Another thing that happened during this period was that I dissolved my alliance with Andhra. They are a useless ally and I would rather have those provinces for myself so I can continue my conquest towards the Bengal trade node. So after fighting the pretender rebels, my manpower was suffering even more and I didn't want to wait just for the manpower to recover while doing nothing. So I disbanded some of the zero regiments and got some mercs infantry instead. We have the economy to afford mercs early on. I still had truce with Bahamani, so it was time to attack Gujarat instead. They had big allies in Multan and Sindh, but my ally Mewar was ready to come in too. This war went on for a long time as well and I eventually pieced out Sindh and Multan for some money and war reps. While fighting Gujarat, I had to make sure that Mewar didn't occupy any coastal provinces because I really wanted those. So at the end of the war, I took some provinces and all of Gujarat's money. This war took a while, but by 1461, I had all the west coast of Indian Peninsula, which is nice because it has some trade goods and it also gives us some trade power in the Gujarat trade node. Next, it was time to attack Bahamanis again, and luckily their only ally Andhra would not join in the war. So I called in my ally Mewar as I still had no manpower and I wanted to make this war a quick one. Bahamanis still have a big economy though and they can hire a lot of mercs. Plus they have a lot of forts, so this war again took a while to complete, but in 4 years I was able to take 100 war score worth of provinces. I decided to release Golconda as a vassal here as they have some course. It also completes a mission and gives us even more claims. The mission tree here is basically telling us to conquer all of Bahamanis, which will in turn complete an achievement. It's called a tale of two families where you need to occupy the other capital and have them not exist. It's actually a very easy achievement to get. Completing the mission also gives an option to change the capital city. I like doing that since it gives more dev in the capital and a level 3 fort. One thing to remember here though is that once you change the capital, your trade city also moves and now Deccan is your home trade node. Which is not good because we don't have as much trade power there and we will not earn as much trade income. So I would recommend to move the trade city back in Coromandel trade node. It costs 200 diplo power but it's worth the long term investment. So in 1467, Vijayanagar has grown significantly. 
We still don't have any manpower, but we will attack Andhra anyways, because they don't have an ally, and I really want to get to Orissa and eventually Bengal. And we can do it as a reconquest for using our new vessel CB. I full annex Andhra, and the A is still not that bad. You might notice that we have conquered a lot in just 25 years, and yet aggressive expansion is not an issue. Like I mentioned earlier, playing as Vijayanagar is not that hard. And just as I say that, the game decided to up the difficulty a bit. My heir had died a year ago, and then my king decided to die as well without an heir. So now I had a new king who had good stats in 434, but the legitimacy was at 20, which meant it was time for a civil war disaster. The civil war takes up every time we are overextended, which meant I had to watch our conquests now. Well, not to get faced by such trivial things, I decided to attack Orissa next anyways. They had a couple of minor allies, and I took all their money and a few provinces. So now, since we are overextended, the civil war would tick up till we get the courting done. During this time, I also start developing Renaissance Institution. Luckily, we have a couple of provinces with cloth and farmlands. In case you don't know this, cloth gives minus 10% def cost and farmlands give another 5% discount. So typically, these provinces are the best one to develop an institution in. Next, I decided to attack another minor nation nearby and gave all the provinces to my vassal. So I don't get any ore extension and no more ticks for the civil war disaster, as we were already at 44.5% disaster tick. And by the way, the disaster stops when legitimacy is 75, so it was going to be a while till we get there. I still didn't want to just sit around and do nothing, so I attacked Junagar next. They were allied to my ally Mewar, but Mewar was busy in another war and would not join in, so it was a perfect time to attack and vassalize them. Again, I did not take the provinces for myself because I did not want any ore extension right now. Immediately after that, I attacked Malva, one of the bigger central nations. My ally would join in the war now, and the objective of this war was just to get some money and keep the enemies weakened. I did not take any provinces from them. Instead, I took all their money, war reps, and trade power. Immediately after that, I saw that Bahamanis were involved in a couple of wars, so I had to attack them as well. This was an easy war, and I took 100% war score worth of provinces. I divided those provinces between me and my vassal to save some admin points, and just like that, the civil war was ticking once more. Well, I couldn't do much about it, so while the provinces were getting cored, I decided to attack Gujarat next. I called in my ally Mewar to take care of Delhi, and I full annexed Gujarat and gave all those provinces to my new vassal, Junagar. Since we had made a lot of progress in a very short time, the AE was looking a bit on the high side. Still not high enough to warrant a serious coalition, but it was time to temper the pace of the conquest a little bit. Also, the civil war disaster was now at 74.5%, which is not good. And we still only have 36 legitimacy. So now I was wondering what to do about it, when just in few months, my ruler decided to die early and now I had a new king. And his stats were not that great at 242, but he had minus 5% aggressive expansion, which is very useful here, and he had 68 legitimacy, which was great. So it was time to resume the conquest again. Earlier, I had colonized the Andaman Islands and got a claim on Pasai. So I declared on Pasai next. It was a quick war and I took some rich provinces from them. This meant a lot more AE, but it still wasn't a huge deal. Also now, I didn't have to worry about civil war taking because I could just buy 10 legitimacy using 100 military points. Yes, not the best use of military points. I mean, I could have just waited a few years for legitimacy to tick up on its own, but really, who has time for that? After this, I wanted to attack Bengal next, but they had actually allied Ming, and I really didn't want to waste my time fighting Ming at this point. Luckily, Bengal also had allied Delhi and Malwa, so I attacked Malwa instead, which would bring in Bengal too. This was a long war and it took a while, but I managed to piece out Bengal and annul their alliance with Ming. Then I took as many provinces as I could from Malwa, and next it was time to finish up Bahamanis. They only had a few provinces, and finishing them up means completing the achievement. After that quick war, I decided to attack Patna, who were allied to Bengal. From this war, I took more money from Bengal to make sure they didn't get too strong. Then I full annexed Patna and gave it to my vassal. As the nations around here have the Garjati tradition, which increases the coring cost by 50%. I wanted to create more vassals to expand faster, so I decided to start annexing one of my earlier vassals, Jaffna. After my last war, the AU was getting a bit too high in India, so I changed directions and decided to go to the Spice Islands once more. The target was Pasai again, and I took 100 war score provinces from them. The AU was getting worse, obviously, but it was still manageable. 
After that, I decided to wait for a few years catching up on tech and embracing colonialism and finally in 1520, I attacked Bengal once more. They had a few allies but nothing I couldn't handle. The war only took 3 years and I managed to get some big coastal provinces in the Bengal trade node. And in 1523, I had 1000 development, which means upgrading the government rank to empire. Next, it was time to take on Jeanpur as they had grown rather big. The war wasn't that hard and in the end, I took all their money and some provinces. Now the aggressive expansion was getting to the point where I had to watch how many provinces I should take. From the newly conquered provinces, I released the new vassal of Garha who has some course in central India. Immediately after this war, I got the super lucky event the talented and ambitious daughter, which gives a 666 heir. My current ruler was 242 and 41 years old already, and I couldn't wait for the 666 heir. And no, she did not die from any hunting accidents. Next, I wanted to cut down Bengal again, so I attacked another of their ally, Keda. I again took a lot of money from Bengal, then pieced out Malacca for more money and trade power, and finally vassalized Keda. I was hoping to expand in the area and give some provinces to my vassal. Unfortunately though, both Malacca and Ayutthaya decided to become Ming's tributaries. I was over the relation limit now, so I decided to start annexing my other vassal Junagar. And after this war, I finally had more dev than Ming, and I was now the number one great power. And you can see here, I don't even have all of India, and I'm already bigger than Ming. The whole Indian region has a lot of provinces and a lot of development. And to get more of that development, it was time to attack Bengal once more in 1545. They were allied to Malwa and Pasai. So I full annexed Pasai, pieced out Malwa for money and annulled all their alliances. Then I full sieged Bengal and took 100 war score provinces from them. After this, I attacked Jaunpur again when I saw that their ally Timurids won't answer the call. Timurids in my game were rather big, although now they were involved in three different wars and they would never recover from this. So it was a good time to attack Jaunpur. I called in my ally Mewar and I took as many provinces as I could from Jaunpur and the aggressive expansion was again high, but I wasn't worried about it. So in 1551, Vijayanagar has grown a lot. Now we have most of India and a lot of spice islands, which means a very healthy economy. And if you look at the tolerance right now, we have 7.1 tolerance of true faith and only minus 0.9 tolerance for heathens and heretics, which is huge. And that really helps with unrest in new provinces. Finally, in 1560, I was ready to attack Malwa. They were allied to Jaunpur, Afghanistan, Bengal, and Sirhind. That is a lot of allies, so I had to call in my ally Mewar as well, and I declared on them. We were fighting a lot of nations, but we still had a larger army. I pieced out Jaunpur, Bengal, and Afghanistan for some money. Then I took 100 war score provinces from Malwa again, and gave them all to my new vassal Garha. Like I mentioned earlier, AE was a bit on the high side, so again I changed directions and this time expanded in Africa by attacking the Madagascar natives and taking 100 province war score from them. All these provinces along with some islands in the Indian Ocean were added to the trade company. Next I decided to attack Brunei because they have a lot of good provinces. They had couple of minor allies and so the war wasn't going to be hard. I took one province from Malacca and gave it to my vassal Keda. Then I almost full annexed Brunei barring one province and no surprises that AE was getting a bit too much. Although I had truces with most of the nations so I wasn't worried. And to ensure that they did not join the coalition, I decided to attack Bengal immediately after the truce expired. They were allied to Malacca, Malwa and Anam who were a sizable nation in my game surprisingly. I had the naval dominance though so this war was all about just shifting armies between Indian mainland and Southeast Asian islands. I took one more province from Malacca and gave it to my vassal. Then I took 100% war score provinces from Bengal once more. They have a lot of development and it takes a while to full annex them. Once the provinces were cored, I attacked Kutai in 1588 and full annexed them. Just like Brunei, they also have some very good provinces. Next, I decided to diplovassalize Gorkha in the Himalayas so I could use their cores and claims to expand there. Gorkhas also have pretty good military ideas, so they are a useful vassal to keep around. Using their conquest CB, I attacked another miner nearby who was allied to Jaunpur, which was great because Jaunpur was allied to Mamluks and I didn't really want to fight them directly. So I took some money from Jaunpur and annulled their alliance with Mamluks and revoked some courts. Then I full annexed the primary target and gave it to my vassal. After this, I decided to end my alliance with Mewar because we need some provinces there to form Bharat. And since we are now an ally down, I immediately allied another big nation in Transoxiana who were super strong in my game. 
While waiting for the Mewar truce to expire, I decided to attack other minor nations in Philippines and I full annexed them. So in 1598, you can see a lot of Vijayanagar yellow all over India, most of Spice Islands and some in Africa. The Mewar truce finally ended in 1600 and I declared on them. They only had one minor ally and I didn't even need to call my ally for this war. I full sieged them and took just the provinces I needed to form Bharat for 100 war score. The borders are a bit weird, but I was getting a bit impatient now. Also during this war, global trade spawned in Vijayanagar, which is great. I wasn't really going for it and I just got lucky that the Coromandel trade node was super rich. It can be done pretty consistently if you concentrate a bit more on colonizing the Spice Island and expanding in the Bengal, Deccan and Gujarat trade node. Now to form Bharat, the last province I needed was in Jaunpur, so I attacked them and took as many provinces as I could. So in 1608, I have most of India, and after coring all the provinces in 1611, I was ready to form Bharat. Forming Bharat gives us permanent claims on all of Indian region, making future wars easier and cheaper. We also get a cool new mission tree and a new national idea set, which are actually pretty nice. After this, you can just roll through India easily while expanding more in Africa and Southeast Asia. You can also start colonizing Australia and the Americas. And talking of colonizing, let's take a look at the idea groups that might help the Vijayanagar run. I like to take exploration ideas at the start. It's important to lock down the small islands in the Indian Ocean to restrict European access to the Spice Islands. This will give you ample time to take them for yourself and you don't have to rush it. After that, I would go either quality or influence depending on your gameplay. I took quality for this playthrough because I was a bit short on Diplo points. Also, the combat ability bonuses are nice and stack well with Vijayanagar and later Bharat ideas. Next, I took Humanist because you don't need it early as most of the India is Hindu. But once you start expanding in Africa and Spice Islands, you will need that extra religious unity. I also like to stack the tolerance bonuses. And after that, you can either go another military idea like offensive or you can go deploy ideas. It will all depend on your gameplay style and what you want to do with your game. And that was my Vijayanagar to Bharat playthrough. I quite enjoy playing in India actually. There are a lot of different nations and you can play either as Hindu and form Bharat or play Muslim and form Hindustan. Both are a good bid game target to have. Expanding in India is also easier because of low aggressive expansion. Just make sure that you get a good vassal with a lot of cores. There's another achievement with Bharat or Hindustan. It's called the Sun Never Sets on the Indian Empire, where you need to own Cape, London, Canton and Ottawa, which can be done if you continue my playthrough from here. You should colonize Cape as early as possible anyways. Then once England has colonies near you, you can start attacking them and take London. You can fight Ming at some point and take over Canton. Fighting Ming is not a problem because your armies are much stronger. And you will take colonization ideas, so you will be colonizing in Americas anyways, where you can get to Ottawa, or you can take it from some other colonizer. Once you have found Bharat or Hindustan, completing the achievement is just a matter of playing the game for another 100 years or so. So hopefully this guide helps out newer players as playing as Vijayanagar is a lot of fun and a really good nation to try as a beginner. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to leave a comment either here or you can join our Discord and share it with other EU4 players. You are watching a Radio Guide. Thanks for your time and I'll see you all in the next one.